Hello friends, today we are learning important engineering material that is cement. It is a material possessing adhesive and cohesive properties and capable of bonding materials like stones, bricks, building blocks, etc. Let's see what are the principal constituents of cement. First is compounds of calcium that is calcareous compounds and the second is combination of aluminium compounds and silicon compounds. Collectively they are called as argillaceous materials. The cement have property of setting and hardening when it reacts with water by virtue of certain chemical reactions. Therefore, they are also called as hydraulic cement. It is called as Portland cement because the origin of cement was from Portland mountain. It is defined as an extremely fine ground product obtained by calcining together at about 1500 degrees Celsius, an intimate and properly proportioned mixture of argillaceous that is called as clay containing and calcareous that is lime containing or compounds of calcium without the addition of anything subsequent to calcination excepting the retarder gypsum. Let's see the general procedure for the cement making. First, the raw materials are obtained from the mountain. Then they are crushed to the respective size, generally of fine powder. Then they are kept ready to fade to the rotary kin. This is the preheater tower where the raw materials are subjected to heat. Then this is the rotary kin where the raw materials are heated up to 1750 degrees Celsius. And also one of the most important thing about the rotary kin is the long flame produced at the bottom of the rotary kin. This is slightly inclined in position. We will study rotary kin in detail later. Then these are the clinkers of cement which are produced. These clinkers are very hot. Therefore they are subjected to cooling in a clinker cooler. Then this is the proportionating equipment. In the proportionate equipment, the respective quantity of gypsum is added. Then it is subjected to cement storage and finally the shipping. Then we move to the manufacture of Portland cement. The raw materials which are required for the manufacture of Portland cement includes first is calcareous materials that is calcium oxide or compounds of calcium, argillaceous materials that is compounds of aluminium and silica that is also called as clay material. Third is powder coal or fuel to burn the raw materials and the fourth is gypsum. In the manufacture of Portland cement, the next step is dry process. In the dry process, the limestone and clay are subjected to gyratory crushers as we have seen in the last pick to obtain 2 to 5 cm size pieces. Then it is subjected to ball mills or tube mills to get a fine powder. Each separate powdered ingredient is stored in a separate hooper. Powdered materials are mixed in the required proportions to get dry raw mix which is stored in storage bins which are called as silos. It is then kept ready to fed to a rotary kin. Next step is wet process. The calcareous raw materials are crushed, powdered and stored in the big storage tanks which are called as silos. Then the argillaceous materials are mixed with water and subjected to wash mills. The obtained product is called as basin washed clay which is stored. Silos and basins are mixed with each other and allowed to flow in a channel to get right proportions. Their chemical composition is checked and this slurry contains about 38 to 40 percent water. The slurry is finally stored in storage tanks and kept ready to fit to a rotary kin. Next is rotary kin. As we have seen in the last picture, burning is usually done in rotary kin. This is a steel tube about 2.5 to 3 meter in diameter and 90 to 120 meter in length lined inside with a refractory bricks. The kin is laid in slightly inclined position at a gradient of 1 in 25 to 1 in 30. This rests on roller bearings which are supported on column of concrete. The kin is capable of rotating at 1 revolution per minute about its longitudinal axis. The burning fuel that is the powdered coal and air is injected at the lower end so that it produces a long flame which hits the interior kin to a maximum temperature of 1750 degrees Celsius. Now we move to the process. The raw mixture which is obtained as a slurry is injected to a kin from the upper end while the hot flame is forced into the kin from the lower end. Due to the slope and slightly inclination, the materials fed in move continuously towards the hottest end at a speed of about 15 meters per hour. As the mixture or slurry gradually descends, the temperature is increasing. In the rotary kin, in the upper part, the temperature is around 400 degrees Celsius. 
This zone is also called as drying zone. The moisture in the slurry fed to the rotary kin gets evaporated. In the central part of the kin, the temperature is around 1000 degrees Celsius. The limestone or slurry undergoes decomposition. This zone is also called as calcination zone. In this, the decomposition of calcium carbonate takes place and it produces calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. In the lower part of the kin, the temperature is around 1500 to 1700 degrees Celsius. This is the important part of the rotary kin. This is also called as clinkering zone. In this zone, the main products of cement are formed. That is dicalcium silicate, tricalcium silicate, tricalcium aluminate and tetracalcium aluminoferrate. We have to remember C2S, C3S, C3A and C4F. C stands for calcium oxide, S stands for SiO2, A stands for Al2O3 and F stands for Fe2O3. C2S stands for 2C and S that is 2CaO plus SiO2. So that comes out to be Ca2SiO4. In the same way C3A stands for 3CaO plus SiO2. C3A stands for 3CaO Al2O3 and C4AF stands for 4CaO 1Al2O3 1Fe2O3. In this way the four main products of cement are formed. The aluminates and silicates of calcium then fuse together to form small hard grey stones which are called as clinkers. The rotary kin at the base is provided with another small rotary kin. In this the hot clinkers fall and cool air is introduced into the small rotary kin. As the clinkers are very hot, these are cooled down with the introduction of air. The hot air produced is again recycled into the rotary kin. The cool clinkers are collected in small trolleys. Finally the grinding takes place and the fine powder is obtained with the help of ball mills or tube mills. During the final grindings, around 2 to 3 percent of powdered gypsum is added. The role of gypsum is to enhance the initial setting. This we will see in detail later. The formula for gypsum is CaSO4 7H2O. Finally, we get tricalcium sulfo aluminate. Finally, packing is done. Each bag usually contains 50 kg of cement. Then this is the chemical composition of the cement. Before packing, the composition of each constituent is checked with the following formulae and finally it is proceed to the packing. This is the difference between the dry process and wet process. Compared to dry process, wet process can be used for any type of raw material, fuel consumption is higher, process is comparatively faster, so cement produced is of superior quality, cost of production of cement is somewhat higher but on the whole the process is cheaper. This is percentage range by mass of each constituent present in cement. We can see that lime is the major constituent of the cement, then silica, alumina and others. Now we have to see the functions of each ingredient in the cement. As we know, lime is the principal constituent. If it is present in lesser or excess quantity, it reduces the strength of the cement and makes it quick setting. Silica imparts strength to the cement. Alumina makes the cement quick setting, but if present in excess, weakens the cement. Calcium sulphate enhances the initial setting which is the most important ingredient of the cement. Iron oxide provides the color. Sulphur trioxide imparts soundness to the cement and alkalis causes cement efferescent. Then chemical constitution of the Portland cement is as follows. As we can see average percentage of tricalcium silicate is around 45 and dicalcium silicate that is C2S takes around 28 days for the setting. Then we move to the characteristics of constituents. The first constituent is tricalcium silicate. It develops high ultimate strength quite rapidly. It is responsible for ultimate strength. The heat of hydration is about 880 kJ per kg. Second is dicalcium silicate which is also responsible for ultimate strength but it is slightly less than the C3S. The heat of hydration is 420 kJ per kg. Third is tricalcium aluminate. It does not contribute much to the strength of the cement. Early strength and ultimate strength are poorest among all the constituents. The heat of hydration is around 250 kJ per kg. Next we move to the setting and hardening of Portland cement. When the cement is mixed with water, it gives a plastic mass which is called as cement paste resulting in the formation of gel and later on to the crystalline products. The process of solidification consists of setting 
and then hardening. The definition is setting is defined as stiffening of the original plastic mass due to initial gel formation and hardening is development of strength due to crystallization. After setting, the process of crystallization starts which is called as hardening. Initial setting of cement paste is mainly due to the hydration of tricalcium aluminate and gel formation is due to tetracalcium alumina ferrite. Now we move to the reactions. All reactions are very easy. When we add water to the cement, following reactions takes place. First reaction is tricalcium aluminate. It reacts with water to form hydrated tricalcium aluminate. We have to remember C3A plus 6H2O gives C3A.6H2O. During this process, 880 kJ per kg of heat is liberated. Second reaction is tetracalcium alumina ferrate. We have to remember as C4AF plus 7H2O gives first product that is C3A6H2O tricalcium aluminate plus hydrated calcium oxide iron oxide. During this process, 420 kJ per kg of heat is liberated. Third reaction is dicalcium silicate reacts with water to give tobermonite gel and calcium hydroxide. During this process, 250 kJ per kg of heat is liberated. The final setting and hardening of cement paste is due to the tubermonite gel. Finally, C2S reacts with water to give tubermonite gel plus 3 molecules of tricalcium hydroxide. During this process, 500 kJ per kg of heat is liberated. The whole process can be seen with the help of flow sheet. First, we have unhydrated cement. To that, we add water to give metastable gel. This is unstable, so it gives stable gel. And finally, we get the crystalline products. Now, we have to see the sequence of chemical reactions during setting and hardening. This can be understood with the help of flow sheet. First, we have cement plus water. It gives a paste. First is the hydration of tricalcium aluminate and tetracalcium aluminate ferrate, which requires one day. Second is the gelation of the, that is the gel formation of tricalcium silicate. It gets completed within seven days. And finally, the gelation of dicalcium silicate and tricalcium silicate together. Total it takes 28 days. And we have to remember that during all these 28 days, the all heat that we have seen, for example, 880, 420, 250, 500 kilojoules per kg. All this heat is liberated during this process. Now we have to see the function of important ingredient in the cement that is gypsum. Tricalcium aluminate when it combines with water, very rapidly the evolution of large amount of heat takes place. After the initial set, the paste becomes somewhat stiff. Without gypsum, the whole mass will get crystallized as fast as possible and we cannot give the desired shape to the cement. Therefore, 2-3% to of gypsum is added. Gypsum retards the dissolution of C3A by forming insoluble calcium sulfo aluminate. This enhances the initial setting and it gives a gel formation which remains soft and we can give the desired shape to the cement by adding it to the respective mold. Thus it retards the early initial set of the cement. Now we move to the concrete and RCC. Concrete is the building and structural material obtained by mixing binding material that is cement or lime. Inert material aggregates like sand, crushed stone, gravels, broken brick, etc. and water in a suitable proportion and which can be readily molded into almost any desired shape and when set it is compact, rigid, strong and durable. When lime is the binding material, the concrete is known as lime concrete and when cement forms the binding material, it is called as cement concrete. The proportion for watertight works is one part of cement, one part of sand and two parts of gravels. If not required, it can be one part of cement, three parts of sand and five parts of gravels. More the cement within the limits, the more waterproof the concrete will be. Now we have to move to the uses of concrete. It is most important of all non-metallic materials of construction. It ranks second only to steel. It is used for the constructional purpose. It is also used in roads, buildings, floors, roofs, columns, etc. Next is very important that is curing of concrete. We have seen that large amount of heat that may be 880, 420, 500 kilojoules per kg. Heat is liberated during the hydration process. So in all it takes around 28 days during which the heat is always liberated. Therefore it is necessary to maintain the desired moisture 
into the cement blocks. So therefore curing is the process of maintaining a satisfactory moisture content and favorable temperature in concrete during the period immediately following placement, the requirement of service. If the satisfactory moisture is not maintained, cement work is likely to develop cracks. Thus curing also helps in dissipation of heat. Next we move to the RCC that is reinforced concrete construction. Plain concrete has a great compressive strength but little ability to withstand tension. The structures which are required to bear tensile stresses are reinforced or strengthened by embedding steel bars or rods and metal meshes in such a way that the tension is taken up by the steel while the concrete carries the compression. We have seen in the case of construction of building, in the molds where the cement is added, there are also steel bars or steel rods. So these steel rods together with the cement is called as beam of a building. So this beam takes the all load of the building. The building which is constructed by using these beams is called as reinforced concrete construction. So the definition is the combination of steel and concrete produces structure called as reinforced concrete construction which can bear all types of loads. Reinforced concrete work is mostly used in floor beams, piers, lintels, etc. Let's see what are the advantages of RCC over plain concrete. RCC is easier to make and cast into any desired shapes which can bear all types of loads. It possesses greater rigidity, moisture and fire resistance. Steel reinforcement also tends to distribute the shrinkage cracks thus preventing the formation of large cracks. Its maintenance cost is practically negligible. Let's see the decay of concrete. In acidic water, the lime concrete dissolves thereby making it weak. So pH is the important factor. But generally in case of water, the pH is around 7. The pH is slightly greater than 7. So therefore such water do not have any marked effect on the strength of concrete. However, as the acidity increases, the deterioration of the concrete also enhances. Second factor is, as the concentration of lime increases, the deterioration of the concrete enhances. Third factor is, lime is more soluble in soft water than hard water. Consequently, the deterioration of concrete is more quick in soft water compared to hard water. Next factor is, lime of concrete is also removed by sulfates and chlorides present in water. Thus decreases the strength of the cement. Next factor is, if concrete is soaked in mineral oil for some time, its resistance to abrasion decreases. And last is, sugar also causes concrete failure. If even as low as 0.1% sugar is added to cement, the setting time is delayed and its strength greatly reduced during the first 4 weeks. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe for more such videos.